right. Um, welcome to chapter three, biochemistry. Um, I love biochemistry. I had a, a love-hate relationship with chemistry um, all the way through, you know, my first couple years of college. It just wasn't really clicking in my head. I could... I could do labs. I loved labs. That was interesting. I understood the labs. When it came to chemistry lecture, it was a foreign language to me. Until I got to organic chemistry. Until I got into that biochemistry. And when I could see how the chemical principles apply to life, it just started clicking for me. So um, I enjoy biochemistry. Um, if you have kind of a hobby in nutrition and you like macromolecules, um, you you'll probably make a connection to this biochemistry. Uh, when we teach it at school, um, in my in my everyday classroom, we we relate it a lot to food because food is something that everyone can understand. So when we talk about biochemistry today, I'm gonna try to give food examples. I'm gonna try to tie it to the ways that you're gonna encounter it in everyday life. And it's very easy to do because these are the molecules that make up us. These are the molecules that allow us to function. So we're going to kind of get into the weeds a little bit and talk about each of the major classes and um, how they relate to what you see every day and in life. So starting with macromolecules. So when we talk about macromolecules, when we talk about biochemistry, we're talking about those large molecules that help to build the structures that make up our bodies, that allow our bodies to function correctly. So these are large molecules made up of repeating subunits. Um, they are often made from very simple organic molecules that we call monomers. So monomers are small molecules that are bound together. So they're connected together over and over and over again to make a polymer, which is a large molecule. Um, so, so for instance, you can imagine, let's say these monomers are individual Lego blocks. And when we click those Lego blocks together, when we build a tower out of those Lego blocks, we get polymers. Um, you could imagine your monomers are a single bead. Um, and then when you string those beads together, you get a polymer, a necklace. You can imagine it as train cars. So when you hook those train cars together, you get that train, which is your polymer. Um, and when we talk about our macromolecules, they are made up of those monomers, and those monomers create the polymers. So how do we make macromolecules? Well, there's a reaction called a dehydration synthesis reaction. And essentially, when you think of the word dehydrate, if we're dehydrating something, we're taking water out of it. So like if you're making fruit jerky or beef jerky or deer jerky, you put it in that dehydrator and it pulls the water out of the material. Dehydration synthesis does the same thing. It's a, it's a chemical process where we're putting the monomers together, we're clicking those Legos together, we're hooking those train cars together, and we're doing it using covalent bonds that removes water. So we are pulling the water out of those individual molecules, and by doing that, so by removing our oxygens and our hydrogens from the individual molecules, we have a water byproduct, but we join those two individual molecules together. So molecule A loses an oxygen, molecule B loses two hydrogens. And that gives us our water byproduct, and that gives us a new product, a new molecule that is A plus B. All right. Now, when we form these water molecules, when we form this bond right here, we're storing energy. It requires energy to form that bond, so that bond is holding that energy. Now, it's just exactly the opposite when we're breaking macromolecules. One of the reasons why water is so important for life, water is so important for us, is because of the hydrolysis reaction. And this is the, the, the chemical reaction that allows you to break down these large molecules. When you look at the word hydrolysis, you've got hydro, which we know means water, and then lysis, which means to split. So we are splitting the molecules using water. So in our diagram, we add water back in 
and that allows us to break into two different pieces. Um, one of those molecules will gain hydrogen and the other one will gain a hydroxide. And so when we break these bonds, if you remember, when we made the bonds, we stored energy. When we break the bonds, we're releasing that energy. So water is essential for us because it allows us to break down, for instance, the food that we eat so that we can use the nutrients, so that we can use the molecules within that food. And then um, we pull water from those nutrients, those molecules that we get from our food when we are making new things. Like if we need new proteins for our cells to function, we're pulling waters from those individual amino acids. So there are four major classes of macromolecules that we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about carbs, we'll talk about lipids, we'll talk about proteins, and we'll talk about nucleic acids. All right. So starting with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are an essential part of our diet. They're extremely important. Um, they make up a lot of our diet. Um, now, the type of carbohydrate that you're eating does matter, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, that later. But carbohydrates can be found in your grains and your fruits and your vegetables, um, and then, of course, your sugars as well. Carbohydrates provide energy for our body to function. It is our number one go-to molecule. It is the first molecule that our bodies turn to when we need energy, specifically glucose. You've probably heard the term blood glucose. That is the molecule that our bodies are breaking down into ATP, which is our energy currency for ourselves. Carbohydrates are all composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only in a one to two to one ratio. So for every one carbon, you'll have two hydrogens and one oxygen. When we look at the word carbohydrate, that carbo is literally referring to carbon. That hydrate is referring to the water that it requires to make it or break it. There are three classifications, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. And we're going to get into the weeds on that one. Monosaccharides, mono meaning one is a monomer of a carbohydrate known as a simple sugar. So this is a single carbohydrate molecule, a single sugar molecule. Examples are going to be glucose, which is your most common, fructose, you can see fructose right here, and then um, deoxyribose and ribose, which are both parts of your nucleic acid. Deoxyribose is found in DNA. It's the molecule that DNA is made of, made, named from, deoxyribonucleic acid, and ribose is found in RNA. All right. Um, most of your most of your carbohydrates end with the suffix OSE, especially your monosaccharides, where you have glucose and fructose and galactose. So that's kind of a clue. In chemistry, when they talk about nomenclature, they talk about naming molecules. There's patterns within the nomenclature that you can use. And when you have that, that suffix of OSE, you know that that's a monosaccharide. So let's spend just a, a small amount of time talking about glucose. It's an important source of energy and molecule. It's the energy that's used in cellular respiration. which happens in the mitochondrion, and it's used to make that ATP. And ATP is the energy molecule that we use as energy. So it's like we have to have glucose. It's important for energy because it allows us to make ATP. Often, extra glucose is stored as um, starch or glycogen, depending on what type of organism you you are, so animal versus plant. Glucose, galactose and fructose, which are the three that you see right here, they're all isomers. So remember from our last lecture, isomers are chemically the same, but structurally different. So these all three are C6H12O6. Notice your pattern. You have a one to two to one ratio here, but they are structurally different where you could see where they've highlighted the difference between them. Uh, monosaccharides can exist as linear chains or ring-shaped molecules. So you can see the linear chain shape right here, 
and you can see the ring shape right there. And the reason you see differences in it is that rings tend to form an aqueous solution, so water-based solution. So if you put them in water, they're going to be ring-shaped, and and if you typically um, and not when they're not in water. Disaccharides. So if mono means one. Di means two. So a disaccharide is formed when two monosaccharides bond together using that dehydration synthesis reaction. So they're bound together and we're pulling that water out. The covalent bond between carbohydrate molecules is known as a glycosidic linkage. Now, you're going to find as we move through each of the four classifications of macromolecules, they're all going to be covalent bonds. They're all covalent bonds, but they all have their special names. So a covalent bond and a carbohydrate is known as a glycosidic linkage. Examples of disaccharides, lactose, maltose, and sucrose. Um, so lactose, which is your middle molecule right here, is made up of glucose and galactose, and it's found in milk. Um, so individuals who are lactose intolerant can't break this molecule down very well. Maltose, um, which is your bottom one right here. Maltose is found in malt sugar. And then sucrose, which is your top one right here. Sucrose is made of glucose and fructose, and it's our most common kind. And it's the kind that um, makes all of our sweets sweet, and that is our table sugar. Um, and then we, we move to this. I like this one. We have all of these different carbohydrates here, and they're, they're pondering the meaning of life. So how do I know if my reality is the same? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? And we have all of these complex thoughts. Our complex uh, carbohydrates are known as polysaccharides. So if mono means one and di means two, poly means many. So we're looking at many monomers bound together to make this long chain, this large, complex carbohydrate polysaccharides. Examples of polysaccharides are starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Those are the ones that you're gonna come in most common with, and then also chitin. Um, starch is when the extra glucose that is produced in plants, so you got to remember that we, plants go through photosynthesis and they take sunlight and they take water and they take carbon dioxide and they produce glucose, right? The extra glucose that plants produce, so the, the glucose that the plants themselves are not using as energy and for growth is stored, in the form of starch. And they store it in seeds and they store it in roots. Now, the starch stored in seeds is used to help that seed grow. So when that seed starts to germinate, it has that food source, it has that energy source that it can draw on until it gets a root system, until it in, can access water, until it gets through the through the soil and can access the sunlight so it can have that water and sunlight and carbon dioxide that's needed for growth. Um, and then they'll store it as roots uh, so that it can access that. Now, we, and myself in particular, love starch that's stored in roots because when we talk about starch stored in roots, we're talking about potatoes and carrots. And those are some of my Favorites. I love potatoes and carrots and green beans. Those are my go-to. Um, seeds are going to be like your rice. All right, so let's color code this a little bit just because it's interesting. So our roots are our potatoes and carrots in our example here. And our seeds are our rice, our grains, corn, grains like wheat, all right, um, wheat kernels, rice kernels, rye, those are all examples of seeds um, where starch is stored in. And that's a major source of food for us and for animals. Um, you also need to think about like fruits and things like that. 
All right. Um, glycogen is another type of starch that we're going to talk about. Um, it's glucose storage in humans and vertebrates, so animals, birds, mammals, uh, amphibians, reptiles, those vertebrates. Our extra glucose gets stored in our liver and muscle cells as glycogen. Um, so, and it's important that we have this storage because when our blood glucose levels get too low, our bodies will take that glycogen and convert it back to glucose so we can bring our blood glucose levels back up. And it's important that our body maintains that blood glucose level because we have to have access to the glucose so that we can make ATP, so that our, our muscles can function, so that our nerves can file. Uh, fire correctly. So that ATP is extremely important, which is why our blood glucose levels are extremely important. Now, when our blood glucose levels get high, if our body is working correctly, we're converting that into glycogen. And then when it gets too low, it converts it back. All right. So um, homeostasis uses that glycogen to help maintain our blood glucose levels. Now, when we look at starch and glycogen, these are all storage polysaccharides. All right, so this is an example, a diagram that illustrates our polysaccharides where you have multiple glucose molecules that are bound together and they create these large polysaccharides. So, you know, when we illustrate it, we illustrate it with just, you know, a handful of molecules that are bound together. But what we need to understand, these are large molecules. Um, so they're made up of many, many subunits. All right, so more polysaccharides. Other polysaccharides include cellulose. Cellulose are found in plants and other, other organisms. They are structural, and then they make up, the, because they make up a majority of a plant cell wall. Um, cellulose helps to toughen, um, gives it rigidity, and so it, it's found in those cell walls. It's, it's kind of like the rebar in... Um, a concrete wall. So like you're building a basement and you, you put rebar, you put reinforcements in that basement, you pour that concrete in there and it helps to add strength and stability to that concrete wall. And that's kind of how cellulose works in plants. We as humans do not have the enzymes to break it down. We can't break down most cellulose. It's insoluble for us. However, um, there are organisms, some herbivores, such as cows and koalas and buffaloes and horses, um, they have bacteria living in their digestive systems. And they have proteists living within their digestive systems, their rumen, that secrete enzyme called cellulase. And that enzyme breaks down the cellulose. So organisms such as herbivores, so our cows, um, they themselves cannot break down that cellulose, but the bacteria living in their gut can. And because they break down that cellulose for them, they are able to access the nutrients in that, in that plant. So grazers will also have cellulose digesting bacteria in their appendix. It's kind of like a storage area. Um, another example is termites. Termites have a symbiotic relationship that also allows them to break down cellulose. And then our last one that we're going to talk about is chitin. Chitin is a polysaccharide that contains nitrogen, so it's different than the other three. It's different than cellulose and glycogen and, and starch. It's still structural. It gives strength and shape, and it's found in arthropod exoskeleton. So you got to remember, our insects, our crustaceans like our lobsters, um, our crabs, spiders, they don't have that endoskeleton. They don't have the bones or the cartilage skeleton that that animals have. They have a hard exoskeleton, and it's made of a, a polysaccharide called chitin. It's also a major component of fungal cell walls, so the fungus. So when we talk about cellulose and we talk about chitin, they are both structural polysaccharides. All right. So let's just take a little quiz here. What type of complex carbohydrate is being represented? And is it a storage or a structural molecule? All right, so if you said, number one, that you were looking at starch, you are correct. And it is a storage molecule. 
What about this one? What are we looking at here? What is represented by this? And what is our answer? And what is what kind of molecule is it? If you said glycogen and storage, you would be correct. The next one. Cellulose and structural. And then the last one. Chitin and structural. All right. So let's talk about nutrition. Carbohydrates are good for you. They are. They're good for us. We need them. They're our first source of energy within our bodies. There are diets and there are diet gurus and diet plans out there that restrict carbohydrates. And some of them restrict them completely. Um, so those plans will tell followers that they should be avoided. Right? And the question is, should they really be avoided? Avoided. Carbohydrates have been an important part of our human diet for thousands of years. And they're an important part of a well-balanced diet. It's a matter of selecting the correct carbohydrates. Um, so, for instance, if you're selecting carbohydrates that are highly refined, like that have a lot of refined sugar in them, like candies and soda, uh, beverages like that, uh, a lot of refined white flours, then those are high in simple sugars. And um, while they give you lots of glucose, they'll cause your blood glucose to spike and then you have to come back down. So those are the ones that you don't want to eat a ton of every day. I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat them at all. I'm just saying that those are the ones you don't want to overeat on. If you're eating um, fruits, if you're eating complex carbohydrates, vegetables, um, those are the type of carbohydrates that are more, quote unquote, um, healthy. I don't know if healthy is the word I want to go for, but those are more balanced carbohydrates. They take longer for your body to process. They're going to keep your blood sugar um, at, a, at a more level um more constant level. They're not going to spike as bad. Um, I get really confused when I hear diets and diet, diet gurus, people say that you shouldn't eat fruits. Fruits are higher in sugar. They are higher in sugar. They are high in sugar compared to like celery, but it's not the same type of sugar as what you're going to find in a Hershey's bar. So your body's going to react to it differently and it's going to process it differently. Carbohydrates are an essential part of our diet. And we'll talk about why uh, the energy aspect of carbohydrates. And there's also very important uses in those carbohydrates. There's soluble and insoluble polysaccharides, insoluble and insoluble fibers. So you're talking about eating that apple. That apple has a lot of soluble fiber in it. And soluble fiber is important for maintaining our cholesterol. So if we avoid carbohydrates altogether, we're also avoiding the carbohydrates that are important for our body and help to protect us, like soluble fibers, like insoluble fibers. Um, so insoluble fibers promote regular bowel movements. Um, we don't want to think about it, but if we don't poop, we're going to get sick. Right? So it's important that our digestive tract is moving um, forward always. It helps to regulate um, blood sugar. It helps to bind to bad cholesterols in the small intestine. And if we can bind to those cholesterols and keeping it from entering the bloodstream, then that's going to make our cardiovascular health better. Uh, it gives us a full feeling while we're eating. It helps us to feel full faster. And if we're feeling full faster, we're not going to eat as much. Um, and it provides that important glucose for ATP. And we have to have ATP to function. We cannot have muscle contraction without ATP. Um, we can't move ions around our body, certain ions in certain directions without ATP. So we have to have the glucose so that we can get the ATP. So all I'm saying is when someone says to cut out one of the four major macronutrients in your diet, you might want to think critically and say, is there a medical reason for this? Um, 
So for instance, like when you're talking about the keto diet and keto, I'm not bashing keto. I'm not going to say anything bad about keto, but keto was initially developed to help individuals that have seizure problems. And it is very successful for that with those individuals. And it's been taken and applied to the general population. So the question is, does the general population need to go on a ketogenic diet? Or does the general population need to be able to maintain a healthy diet? So I am just getting off my soapbox here for a second. And I'm going to say that a low calorie, varied diet combined with exercise and water is a great way to maintain or lose weight. It's a calorie in versus a calorie out sort of thing. If you're very active, your body's going to need more calories. If you're not as active, your body's going to need less calories. Never start a serious diet change without consulting your medical professionals. All right, off that soapbox. Um, lipids. Lipids are extremely diverse class of molecules. Um, they're, they're not easily contained in one definition. There's a lot of different types. They have a lot of different functions. However, they are all nonpolar, which means they are hydrophobic. They do not interact with water. They will not dissolve with water. Um, and that's because they're, they're nonpolar because they have hydrocarbons, which if you remember, are carbon-carbon change chains with hydrogens all the way around. All right. Um, lipids include fats, like dietary fats, oils, waxes, phospholipids, and then steroids. They are long-term energy storage. Um, it can serve as insulation. It can serve as protective waterproofing um, layer for plants and feathers and fur. Uh, they help to build hormones, which are chemical signals that or chemical molecules that that signal within living systems, and they're a huge component, the main component of cell membranes. All right, so this is an example of what lipids can do. Um, the hydrophobic aspect of the lipids, the fact that it will not interact with water, interacts with the fur on this otter, and it helps to repel the water. So if the otter is in cold water and the fur repels that water, it keeps the water from getting in close to that otter. It keeps it helps to protect that otter and keep it a little bit warmer um, from those elements. All right, so fats and oils. Fats are made up of two main components. There's a glycerol head, quote unquote head, so it's a glycerol portion of the body, and then fatty acid tails. Um, the glycerol is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and hydroxyl groups, and then your fatty acids are your hydrocarbons that have a fatty acid attached on it. Um, some of these hydrocarbons can be anywhere from 4 to 36 carbons long, with 12 and 18 carbons most common. Three, fatty fat, or rather, three fatty acids attached to the carbons in the glycerol via an ester bond. Now remember, I told you that all of these are covalent bonds, but they have special names depending on what you're talking about. So for instance, glycosidic linkage um, is the, the covalent bond between mo monosaccharides when you're forming a disaccharide or a polysaccharide. Ester bonds or ester linkages are the, the bonds that hold the glycerol to the fatty acid tails. So your ester bond would be right here. Right. So the number and the length of the fatty acid bond to the glycerol determines the type of lip lipids. If it is one fatty acid to one glycerol, so you have a glycerol with one fatty acid on it, it is a monosaccharide. If you have a glycerol with two fatty acids, it is a disaccharide. If you have a glycerol with three fatty acids, it is a trisaccharide, or triglyceride, sorry. Monoglyceride, diglyceride, triglycerides. I slipped back to the carbohydrates for, for a little bit. Triglycerides, which is this one right here, um, are the most important dietary form of lipids. So when we eat, when we consume lipids, whether we're talking about animal fats or plant oils, um, we're consuming mainly triglycerides. And this is just a, a the chemical diagram. So you have your glycerol molecule right here. You can see 
that the hydrogen here is going to combine with the fatty acid in right there. And we're going to pull out H2O. We're going to remove it in our dehydration synthesis reaction. And that help, allows us to build triglyc triglycerides. So this is your glycerol molecule right here. Um, here. So this is our glycerol. And this is our glycerol molecule, molecule right here. And this is our fatty acid, and you have three of them for your triglyceride. All right, so what's the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats? Um, in a saturated fatty acid, only single bonds between the neighboring carbon um, carbons in, in the hydrocarbon chain. So your carbons are only single covalent bonded together. Um, in an unsaturated fatty acid, the hydrocarbon chain contains at least one double bond. They can have more. Um, if it's a single double bond, it's a monounsaturated fat. If it is a two or more, it's that poly. Remember that poly means many. All right, so saturated fatty acids are saturated with hydrogens. That means the maximum number of hydrogens are bonded to the carbon backbone. Carbon, if you remember, contains four bonds. So that means that for every carbon, you have two hydrogens. So we are saturated. Let me make this one smaller because it kind of got into the notes there. All right. Now, um, unsaturated fatty acids, because we have this double bond right here, that means that we can't hold as many hydrogens as if it were a single bond. So remember, carbon only holds four bonds. So one, two, three, four. This, this carbon has one, two, three, four. Now this one can hold two. And this one can hold two. But this one right here, because of this double bond, can't hold as many. All right. So let's go back to saturated. So we're back on this side of the screen. Um, saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature, and I've got a diagram in the next couple slides that will help explain that. And these are usually in animal or origin. So if you think about saturated fatty acids, you can think about um, chicken fat or the fat along the edge of a steak or the fat along the edge of a pork chop. It, um, the fat that results from bacon grease. Um, like you talk about bacon grease, you cook bacon, and then if you leave that pan there, so maybe you can't immediately can clean your kitchen, you have to leave your pan out, you come out back to your pan later when it's cooled off, and that bacon grease is solidified. It is an animal fat, and at room temperature, once the pan is cooled off, it is, at, it is a solid. Now, unsaturated fatty acids on this side are different. The double bonds prevent... Um, the double bonds cause a kink or a bend in the chain, and and when we we'll talk about it in a second. But it just means that those or those fatty acids are going to be liquid at room temperature. Um, it has to do with how the atoms are able to move past each other. These are usually in plant origin. So think about corn oil, canola oil, olive oil. Those are going to be your unsaturated fatty acids. So. Identify which one is saturated and which one is unsaturated. So go back to your, go back to your definitions. Which one is saturated and which one is unsaturated? So let's look at this first molecule, molecule one. How? What do the bonds in the carbons look like? What do the bonds in the carbons look like? So when we highlight them. All of these bonds are single, all of these carbons are singly bonded together. All right, let's look at molecule number two. We highlight those. I'm gonna do it a different color just because it's a different molecule. You look at the bonds between these carbons. These carbons and this one have a double bond that you don't see in molecule one. Molecule one is a saturated fatty acid because it has no double bonds. Molecule two is an unsaturated because it has 
this double bond. All right, so I told you that we talk about saturated fats versus unsaturated fats being solids versus liquids. All right, so you have to think about how the kinetic theory of molecules. All molecules are constantly moving, all right? Um, solid molecules, the molecules are tacked in, packed in tight, and they're just kind of shaking in their boots. They're just there vibrating. They're not able to move past each other. They're not able to move away from each other. They're just in their spot moving. Liquid molecules, the molecules are still moving, but they have enough energy that they're able to move past each other. So a solid molecule is going to be just kind of vibrating in its spot. It's going to be packed in tight and it's just kind of vibrating. It's not moving anywhere. It's just basically staying in that spot. In this diagram, there's absolutely nothing to explain that. Liquid molecules, however, have enough energy that they're kind of dancing around each other. They're able to move around. They don't break away, but they can move past each other. They have enough energy. Gas molecules have so much energy that they can move away from each other. All right? Remember your kinetic theory? Solids barely move past, cannot move past each other. They just vibrate in place. Liquids move past each other, and gases break away. They have so much energy, they break away. Now, let's talk about saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids. We said that saturated fatty acids are all single bonded, right? Um, in that unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bond. And that double bond con causes a kink or bend. Okay, so we go back here. It talks about how the double bond causes a kink or a bend in the chain. All right. When you have saturated fatty acids, animal origin, they are solid at room temperature, Okay, these single bonds, they're able to pack in really tight. You see how tight these saturated fatty acids are packed in? They're, they're not very wide. All right, so this makes them more like a solid. Now, because our unsaturated fatty acids here have our kink in that chain, right, they're kinked, it makes them more spread out. And it gives them more opportunity to move. It makes it act like a liquid. So unsaturated fatty acids, because they have the kink in the chain, that means that there's more movement between the, uh, the unsaturated fatty acids and you see them as liquid as room temperature. Um, unsaturated fatty acids can form isomers. Those isomers, if you remember, are geometric isomers, so they can be cis or trans. If you remember back to the last lecture, we've got our carbons here, and these are like that one. And then you have another one where you've got your carbons double bonded. All right? Cis and trans. Just a review. Trans fats um, are considered unhealthy. All right? So trans fats are considered unhealthy. If they're cis fats, they tend to be thought to be more healthy. Um, we find trans fatty acids in hydrogenated oils. And basically trans fats hydrogenated as when in we're adding more hydrogens in. All right. Um, they can lead to an increase of LDL, which is bad cholesterol. So we don't we want to avoid trans fatty acids, trans fats, because they can uh, um, increase our what's considered the harmful cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Another type of fatty acid that we can talk about are omega threes. Um, omega threes are required by the body, but we do not make them. So we have to consume them in order to get them. Um, they are polyunsaturated, so if you remember, polyunsaturated means that there are more than one double bond between our carbons and our fatty acids. 
Sources include salmon, trout, and tuna. And if you're like me and you don't like fish, then you have to take omega-3s in order to get your omega-3s. Um, these are important for heart health because they reduce the risk of that sudden heart attack, that, that killer heart attack. Um, so it's important that we access those omega-3s. So watch your diet on that one. So just a, just a refresher. Um, this one right here is a saturated fatty acid. All of these carbons are single bonded together. Um, unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bond. All right. And you can see in this one, um, I like this one because it shows us um, our cis and our trans. Because you remember our cis, cis means that they're on the same side. Right? And our trans has it on different sides. And it changes the shape of the fatty acid. And so it acts differently because of that. So we talked about energy storage, and I've alluded to the fact that we're going to talk about it in the future, and the future is now. So we're going to talk about carbohydrates, and they're important for energy, and then fats, and they're important for energy in our body. Carbohydrates are the number one molecule used for energy in our bodies. So it is our first molecule. It is our go-to. Our bodies will burn up all the carbohydrates that we have in our bloodstream, and then it'll start accessing the carbohydrates that we have stored in our glycogen. And then once we get past that, it starts accessing the or the energy stored in lipids. So carbohydrates are number one energy source. Lipids, if we don't have carbohydrates, we force it to go into lipids. We go to number two, which is kind of the concept behind those restrictive diets is if you force your body to, if you restrict carbohydrates, then you force your body to access the lipids and then... So then our body uses up the lipids and we lose fat, which is the concept behind those restrictive diets. Um, typically what you see afterwards, though, is if you don't maintain that diet and you start eating carbohydrates again, your body stores it and you'll see a rapid weight gain or, or a return to original weight because our body is trying to restore those lipid stores just in case it ever gets put into starvation mode again. Um, so... All right, back off of the soapbox. Carbohydrates is major molecule used for energy. Uh, we break it down to glucose form, and then we store extra glucose to make the glycogen. Um, as I said, it's our number one molecule to be used for energy. It's essential for the production of ATP, um, and ATP is our energy currency. Uh, for every gram gram of carbohydrate, you get 4.3 kilocalories. Now a kilocalorie is the same as a big C calorie. Let me write that a little neater. A kilocalorie is the same as a big C calorie. These are the calories that you see on your nutrition labels, the big C calories. Um, lipids are energy storage. So instead of energy use, this is energy storage. Um, to use the fats for energy, the glycerol and the fatty acids have to be broken down. The stored fatty acids, um, to use the energy, we have to break it down. To store the energy, they have to be bonded together in triglyceride form. These are extremely high concentration energy storage. So for one gram, the same one gram that we used in carbohydrates, we have nine kilocalories of energy here. All right. So you have almost twice the amount of energy stored in your lipids, so it's a higher concentration. Um, but it even still, it has to be broken down, and then it goes through metabolic uh, pathways to get to the point where we can make ATP, because that ATP is our energy currency. All right, still talking about lipids. We've talked about um basically try fats and oils, fats and oils, um, saturated, unsaturated fats. So now we are at waxes. We are still hydrophobic because all lipids are hydrophobic. And these lipids help prevent water from sticking to surfaces. You can see, kind of see the shine on this, uh, this holly bush. And, um, that's an example of the sunlight glinting off of the glorious wax on that leaf. Um, also, you can find waxes that will cover 
Some of the feathers from aquatic birds, you'll see aquatic birds, they preen and they distribute the oils and waxes on those feathers to help with, um, to repel the water. It helps keep, kind of like the otter in the front of the, the lecture, helps to keep the water, the colder waters in maintain body temperature. Um, and you'll see it covering the surfaces of some plants. Phospholipids is another classification of lipids. These are huge because they are the major component of the plasma membrane. So cell membranes. Phospholip phospholipids make cell membranes. Huge. They are different than triglycerides because you have two fatty acids and a phosphate group bound to your glycerol. If you remember, fatty or triglycerides have a glycerol in three fatty acids. Phospholipids have two fatty acids bound to the glycerol and then a phosphate group bound to that glycerol. It makes it what's called amphithatic. Amphithatic is dual-natured, meaning that part of the phospholipid is hydrophobic and part of the phospholipid is hydrophilic. All right, so the tails of the phospholipid. So a phospholipid kind of looks like this. The tails of the phospholipid are hydrophobic. They fear. They do not want to be around water. They are nonpolar, and they cannot interact with water. The head of the phospholipid, right here, is hydrophilic. That means it will interact with water. Or will. It's, let's just say that it means that it likes water likes water. Um, the head is polar and it interacts, right? So the head has a charge and the tails do not. The charge on the head comes from the phosphate group. You can see this negative right there. It gives it a charge. That means that it's going to interact with the positive and negative end of the water molecules. So this is our head. The tails can be made up of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Now, they don't have to all be one of each, um, but they are made up of both, and they are nonpolar because if you remember, those fatty acids are hydrocarbon chains where you have hydrogens and carbons. So you have that same charge all the way through around the molecule. So they make up the, what's called the phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipid bilayer will by means two phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane. The cell membrane is mainly made up of our phospholipids. It'll also have protein channels and things like that in it. It'll have some steroids in it. But the majority of the subunits that make up the cell membrane are these phospholipids. And if you look, remember, our heads will interact with water and our tails will not. And if you notice, the hydrophobic tails are tucked in the middle and the hydrophilic heads are on the outside. So what does this mean? It means that those tails are away from the water that is found in our intra and extracellular fluid. So outside all of our cells in our body, we have extracellular fluid. And inside our cells, we have intracellular fluid. Um, and that intercellular fluid, that should be inter, intercellular fluid, um, is made of water and ions and things like that. So the tails are protected from that, the water found in those solutions. The phosphate heads on the outside are able to interact with the aqueous portion of the, the fluids inside the cell. So when you look at it, you know, we've got your charged phosphate group here, and you've got your, your um, nonpolar tails that will not interact. When you put them in water, they will orient themselves. Like, so you've got oils here, oil and water. They're going to orient themselves that the parts that can interact with water will and the parts that cannot interact with water will not, all right? And what this does is it controls what can enter and what can leave the cell and the pathways that those molecules can, can take. 
All right, the last type of lipid that we're going to talk about are steroids. Steroids are fused ring structures. You will see some hydrocarbon chains on them, um, side chains, but the main structure itself is a ring, carbon rings. Um, when I teach my students to look at, um, to visually identify steroids, I tell them it's three rings in a doghouse. So you will have rings bound together. Um, let's see if I can draw this. There's three rings, or two rings, and then we have a third ring right here. And then instead of having a six-sided ring, you'll have a five-sided structure. And then you'll, you'll have a side chain sometimes. Those side chains can be attached at different locations. They look different. They look extremely different from other lipids because you don't have all those fatty acids, but they're hydrophobic. They cannot be dissolved in water. The most common steroid that we know um, that we have is cholesterol. It's made in our livers. Um, so this is the kind of steroid that cholesterol that our bodies need to function. It is a precursor to many steroid hormones. So it can become things like testosterone and estradiol. Um, it's a precursor. That means it will, it's the starting material to vitamin D which is um, a non-water soluble vitamin that our bodies use and bile salts. We have to have cholesterol for body functions. And it's also a component of the plasma membrane. You'll find it tucked in between um, those phospholipids. So you'll find it tucked in between the phospholipids. Um, it's involved in cell to cell communication. So it allows cells to communicate with each other. So here is a better diagram than the one that I drew where you have three rings right here. Ring, let's start again. It's not pretty enough for me. Ring, 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 and then you have a doghouse. And then we have a side chain coming off here. So ring, 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 doghouse, and then that's the side chain. All right, we're gonna take a break and then I will come back and finish up proteins and nucleic acids.